Welcome everyone. I'm Arvind, a postdoc from Carnegie Mellon University, and I'll be presenting my work on universal atomic swaps, secure exchange of coins across all blockchains. This was a joint work with Julio from MPI and Pedro from India. As we all are familiar, cryptocurrencies with their trustless payments have revolutionized the payment infrastructure of our society. It is amply clear that this technology is here to stay and is only going to evolve and be adopted in the future. In this scenario, we wish to study the exchange of tokens across these cryptocurrencies, which is one of the most basic economic activity of value. We have two users, Alice and Bob, wanting to exchange their tokens from different cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum in this example. We want the property of atomicity in this exchange that guarantees that either bo both users swap their coins or none of them do. Achieving this property is non-trivial in this setting as there is no trusted exchange service like in a fiat currency system to guarantee fairness in the exchange. A simple attempt would be the following. Alice transfers her ether to Bob in the Ethereum blockchain and Bob transfers his Bitcoin in the Bitcoin blockchain separately. Neither parties can be trusted here. Therefore, a malicious Bob may abscond away with the coin from Alice and not pay her in Bitcoin. In other words, the solution does not guarantee atomicity. Trying to mimic the real world, how about having an exchange service do the swap for us? Here, the users can transfer the coins to the service and the service transfers back the swapped tokens to the users. The issue here is that the service has to remain available and we need quite complex protocols to ensure the service does not steal the coins or to guarantee privacy for users' coins. Another approach for an atomic swap is making use of a third blockchain that supports smart contracts. The logic of the smart contract ensures the atomicity of the swap. But this solution relies on the guarantees and mechanics of this third blockchain and requires complex smart contracts that again could be expensive to execute. Another solution for swaps is via the payment channels. Briefly, a payment channel is a shared address between Alice and Bob. The address has some initial coins, and the, in the case shown here, Alice can make several payments to Bob from the channel. These payments remain off-chain, and only the final payment is posted on the blockchain. If no payment is posted by Bob, Alice can refund all her coins after the channel expires. Notice that before the channel expires, all payments have to be authorized by both users, and unilateral spending of the coins in the channel is simply not possible. The coin swap solution relies on Alice and Bob having two channels in the two respective blockchains. They set up payment transactions in the form of a special script known as hash time lock contract or HTLC for short. A HTLC transaction pays a user if he or she reveals a pre-image of a hash value before some time t. In our case, the HTLC in Ethereum pays to Bob and the HTLC in Bitcoin pays to Alice and consider that both HTLCs ha mention the same hash value. In this case, Alice has the hash pre-image initially. She uses this value and gets the payment in Bitcoin by publishing the transaction and the pre-image. Since it's the same pre-image, Bob learns the, from the uh, blockchain and the payment goes through in Ethereum by publishing the transaction and the pre-image. Notice that if the pre-images are not published before the HTLC timeouts, the tokens are refunded to the original user. But the solution requires the special HTLC script. This restricts the solution's interoperability as some currencies may not offer support for the HTLC script. Also, using the script results in high on-chain costs in the form of transaction fees and affects the fungibility of the tokens involved. Recall that tokens in a currency are said to have high fungibility if all unit tokens in the currency are of the same value. What we want in a coin swap solution is that it preserves fungibility of the tokens, is compatible with a wider class of currencies, and has low on-chain costs. The universality we want is that the users may want to swap multiple assets at the same time, and our swap solution should be able to handle these general cases as well. In this work, our contribution is twofold. We give a multi-asset coin swap solution that only requires the signature verification script, meaning it uses the most commonly used script and requires no special scripts. 
As a consequence, we can swap tokens across all currencies as long as they support a cryptographic authentication mechanism in the form of a digital signature. We also give a multi-asset coin swap solution that is highly efficient, requiring either Schnorr or ECDSH signature verification schemes. Note that many major currencies today support these signature schemes. In this talk, I will only focus on the Schnorr ECDSA construction. For more details and the generic construction, I refer you to our paper. Firstly, we should decide on the notion of atomicity in the multi-asset swap case. As a first attempt, let's call this swap atomic if Alice gets all the coins of Bob, then Bob gets all the coins of Alice. The users, as before, establish payment channels in their respective currencies and set up the payment transactions. This time, the payment transactions are regular transactions unlike the HDLC transactions that we saw before. These regular transactions transfer coins between addresses needing only a signature for auth authorization. We expect Alice to get uh, Alice to get paid first on the right side, and by definition, Bob should get all the coins on the left side. However, we have a problem with this definition. Like before, Alice and Bob set up the payments. This time, Alice only redeems two of the three coins. And by definition, Bob cannot get any coins on the left. In fact, Alice can refund her coins on the left after the timeout. Effectively, Alice steals the coins of Bob, and the right notion of atomicity would should have prevented this case for us. Therefore, the notion we set for atomicity in a multi-asset swap case is that if Alice gets one coin, Bob gets all the coins. To see how this works, we have the setup as before. And if Alice gets the first coin, Bob gets all the coins on the left. Th this is, of course, true for any coin that Alice can get on the right. Alice gets the second coin, Bob gets all, and Alice gets the third one, Bob gets all. Ideally, if Alice is rational, she wants to get all the coins on the right, and Bob anyway would get all the coins on the left. In terms of construction, we make use of adapter signatures, a cryptographic tool using which we achieve the atomicity notion that we described before, using only signature verification scripts on the payment transaction. Adapter signatures are defined with respect to a signature scheme and an uh, entry relation, where we can efficiently sample a statement and a witness pair in the relation. We have a pre-signed algorithm that outputs a pre-signature on a message with respect to the secret key and the statement. It is important to note that the pre-signature is not a valid signature by itself. The pre-verification algorithm lets us verify the validity of a pre-signature. We have an extraction algorithm that extracts the uh, witness of the entry statement given the pre-signature and the signature. Finally, we have an adapter algorithm that given a pre-signature and the witness returns the valid signature. In terms of security, we want unforgeability as usual. But this time, the adversary should not be able to forge even given pre-signatures on messages. We additionally want adaptability that says given a valid pre-signature and a valid witness, we can obtain a valid signature with overwhelming probability. And finally, we want extractability that says we can extract a valid witness given a valid pre-signature and a signature. In terms of concrete constructions, we know of efficient candidates based on the Schnorr, ECDSA, and other Schnorr-like signature schemes in the lattice and isogeny settings. Let us now see uh, how our swap protocol works uh, using these adapter signatures. We have four phases, and during the setup phase, parties establish channels with the appropriate expiry times. Here, the channels are public keys whose secret keys are shared among Alice and Bob. The channels on the left expire a short while after the channels on the right expire. This delay is to give Bob enough time to complete the swap as we will see in the coming slides. The next phase is the lock phase where the payment transactions are set up. For the transactions on the left paying Bob, the parties jointly generate pre-signatures on these transactions. To do this, Alice picks the statement witness pair of the entry relation. They run an efficient two-party protocol and Bob obtains the pre-signatures. All of these pre-signatures are with respect to the same statement that Alice had picked before. 
This is followed by the transactions on the right paying apps. They run the same two-party computation protocol to generate the pre-signatures on these transactions, such that Alice and Bob get the pre-signatures with respect to the same instance that was used on the left side. In the swap complete phase, Alice uses the adapter witness that she knows to adapt all the pre-signatures on the right side to get valid signatures. Alice then publishes the signatures on these transactions on the respective blockchains and gets paid. Bob can pick any transaction signature that Alice published on any of the blockchains on the right. Recall that Bob has the corresponding pre-signature generated during the lock phase. Therefore, he can extract the adapter witness using the extraction algorithm. Now Bob adapts the pre-signatures on the left side to valid signatures as they were also generated with respect to the same statement witness pair. Bob publishes the transactions and the signatures on the respective blockchains and gets paid on the left as expected. We finally have the timeout phase where if Alice fails to get paid on the right or Bob fails to get paid on the left, the parties can refund their coins after the expiry of the chimes. We require a special lock time script for doing this refund. However, in this work, we show how we can remove this lock time script by making use of verifiable timed discrete logarithm, a cryptographic tool that is tailored for realizing channel expiry when the signature scheme is that of Schnorr or ACDSA. Verifiable timed discrete log is a tool where the user has a secret value S that she commits to such that the commitment can be brute forced after some time t, irrespective of the amount of parallel processing used. The privacy guarantee is that before time t, the commitment does not leak any information about the secret value, and the soundness is that we can verify if the commitment indeed embeds the exponent of a given group element. We have to modify the swap setup phase to accommodate these V2D logs. While setting up the channels on the left, Bob gives the VTD log commitments to his secret key shares to Alice. These commitments are set for a time of t plus delta. While setting up the channels on the right, Alice gives the VTD log commitments to her secret key shares to Bob. These commitments are again set for a time of t. Both users start brute forcing the commitments right away. The swap lock and the swap complete phases are unchanged. The swap timeout phase is triggered as before if the coins remain unswapped. In this case, the users brute force the VTD log commitments and learn the other user's key share. This means the user who brute forced the commitments has the entire secret key of the channel and therefore can refund the unswapped coins immediately. The advantages of our approach are that now our transactions look like regular payment transactions. Since we do not use the lock time script, no information about the channel expiry is leaked on the chain. Finally, the operations performed on the chain are cheap. The gas costs in Ethereum for every phase is cheaper in our protocol compared to the HPLC-based swap solution. To conclude, in this work, we present the first multi-asset atomic swap protocol that can handle any currency. For many major currencies, we give a practically efficient swap protocol. In terms of open problems, we ask if we can resolve a potential denial of service problem where the parties go offline and trigger a refund always. Another problem to look into is if we can have a scriptless solution where if Alice gets the swapped coins on the right, Bob can get his swapped coins on the left unconditionally, any time, uh, even irrespective of the timeout. I welcome you to read our paper and get in touch with us if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Good work. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, let, let me ask a very quick question uh, since a little bit uh, of the time. So as far as I know, the, a large fraction of the value of uh, cryptocurrencies come from the uh, exchange of currencies and uh, trading. So uh, in your opinion, why did it take so long for researchers to work on the problems that you are, work on the question that you propose in your paper? Um, come again, so I didn't quite catch the question. 
Uh, I, I mean, the, the uh, larger fraction of the value of cryptocurrencies come from the exchange, uh, the intercurrency uh, exchange and trading, right? And uh, my right. question is, so why it takes so long for researchers to work on design the the, the techniques that you propose in your work? Uh, right. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think the emphasis on uh, doing uh, these crypto cryptocurrency swap protocols in a scriptless fashion um, has been around just uh, quite recently. I think initially they, 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 the current deployments are uh, fine with using smart contracts or sp special scripts for this. Um, and th there, are, there, there have been some issues because uh, mainly due to the compatibility point of view because there are many currencies that are excluded because of uh, because of this reason so the the push to develop uh, scriptless uh, protocols is uh, is just you know it's just happening now so maybe maybe that's the reason why the researchers are catching up okay got you oh uh, we have another question from the another <laughs> speaker so please go ahead and uh, this is the last uh, question we're going to ask for this uh, presentation uh, hi, Arvind. This is Mohammed from Monash Unit. Uh, thank hi. you for the talk. Uh, I'm wondering how long it takes in practice to solve this timed uh, commitment. Like, if you really want to build this in a real cryptocurrency, how long would you need? Right. So the the okay. So the commitment has. Uh, so when you when you want to brute force the commitment, there are two aspects, right? So the first is how long do you want the timeout to be in real life? Uh, and whatever, so let's say that in real life you want the timeout to be a uh, few hours or one day, right? And meaning that if the coins remain unswapped, uh, you want the refund to happen, right? This is an agreement that you can have with the the other the other user that you are swapping. So once you have this real uh, real time number with you, you can set your commitments accordingly. So. Uh, yeah, so essentially your real world timeout is going to dictate how long, uh, how hard you want to set your commitment to be, if not the other way around. Uh -huh, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.